Just ahead on One Detroit. As lame duck sessions get underway in the Michigan legislature and Congress, One Detroit contributors Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson debate what they would like to see happen. Plus, Detroiters get a chance to voice their opinions about the revised development plans for the District Detroit. And we'll take a look at the Detroit Public Theater's powerful performance of Nora, written by Michigan native Heather Raffo. It's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bear paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Just ahead on this week's One Detroit, Olympia Development's overhauled plans for the District Detroit are getting the once-over by Detroit residents who will ultimately want to know how it will benefit them. Plus, the Detroit Public Theater puts on a production of Nora by noted playwright and Michigan native Heather Raffo. We'll look at the meaning of the play through the eyes of Raffo, one of the actors and the theater's co-founder. But first up, lawmakers in the state legislature and Congress are wrapping up a year that saw big changes take place after the midterm elections. The traditional lame duck sessions may also look different in the coming weeks. One Detroit contributors Nolan Finley from the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson from American Black Journal sat down to talk about what might happen at these sessions. Stephen, we're entering the most dangerous season of all, lame duck <laughs> political sessions in both the legislature and in Congress. And you head into these last few weeks of the session, it'll run to uh, January 1st, but for all practical purposes, it'll be over by Christmas. Uh, where you know, politicians who are past the elections try to get a lot of things they couldn't get done in the previous <laughs> two years. And let me preface this discussion by saying, I am absolutely opposed to lame duck. I don't think politicians who are no longer accountable to the electorate should be doing big legislation and big uh, earth changing bills like they always try to do. And sometimes they do. This year, uh, both Congress and the state legislature have uh, some ambitious plans. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm, this is one thing that we absolutely agree on. I hate lame duck. I, mm -hmm. I think uh, some of the worst legislation. Uh, of all time comes out of these sessions where people are just trying to, to ram stuff through before they walk out the door. I do think that um, that we're not in for much of uh, uh, of a troubled period now with, uh, with it, at the state level because yeah. uh, you know you've got Republicans who are now in charge. They're leaving. Democrats are coming in. You've got a Democratic governor. I mean, she's not going to sign anything that they that's do. Right. That's, that's too crazy. Um, I would love, I would actually love if they would would take a look at um, at ethics and transparency legislation, which they they've tried a couple times and and, and come up short. But we have this new constitutional amendment um, that that does talk about more transparency in Lansing. I, yep. Even as just a gesture, it'd be nice to see them say, "All right, well, well, here's what that could look like." Um, you know, at the federal level, I, I, I do think that if they could get more more things done to try to deal with uh, the economic uh, situation, uh, that wouldn't be the worst thing in, in in the world. And I would agree with you at the state level. If they could get ethics and transparency legislation finally done, they all say that's what they want. The governor said, "Oh gosh, yes, I'm all for it." And yes, she's yeah, she's finished four years, and it didn't happen. Uh, she didn't push it. The lawmakers, most of the lawmakers who controlled the levers in Lansing didn't allow it to happen. But there are some important things that need to be done there. In Congress, of course, you know, as much as you say, oh, gosh, I don't like lame duck. We all got things on our on our wish list. I mean, I think one thing they could do and maybe get some uh, 
uh, traction on is normalizing marijuana laws, particularly mm -hmm. fixing the part of uh, the federal code that won't allow legal med medical marijuana businesses or recreational marijuana businesses uh, in states where it's legal to access the banking system. Mm -hmm. They're a cash only business. Uh, you got you, these guys walk around with big wads of, of cash in their pockets. They're sitting dumps. Uh, they can't, you know, they can't move their money through uh, the legal banking system through financial institutions. You know, it's rife for continuing to have this quasi legal environment when it comes to envir uh, marijuana in the states. They need to fix that. I, there's proposals to do so, seem to have bipartisan support, but for everything else, I think it's just better off leaving it alone and letting this new Congress work it out. So, so and then the question is, you know, what, what are we going to see from these folks come come January? And and I think in in, in both cases, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of uh, uncertainty about what was well, yeah. done. You know, at the state level, Democrats will have majorities, but they're slim. Uh, and and holding everybody together will 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 be a challenge and and yeah. tempering the demands of you know democratic interests that have been pent up for a really long time because they haven't had control you know you can't give everybody everything uh, so what what becomes a priority that will be really interesting to watch and at the national level whether republicans can kind of hang together in the house uh, given given the strife over uh, over politics in that party and the, the the questions still about whether Kevin McCarthy can even get the votes to be speaker. He um, may not. Yeah, he may not. And so what is that going to look like? What does the opposition look like when the opposition is not unified? What I'm wishing for from Congress in the new year is gridlock. I think we're all better off <laughs> um, after two years of really dramatic lawmaking. If we could cool off a little and let this uh, economy try to normalize I don't think they need to be spending any more money or passing any big expensive new proposals. Let's let this rest and let the economy and everybody else recover from the pandemic and see where it leads us. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we're starting to see the economy turn around. Third quarter, GDP mm -hmm. grew by two points, the, uh, 2%, 2%. Uh, that's uh, more than it has grown all year. It didn't grow uh, the rest of the year. We'll see another bump, I think, in the fourth quarter. But but there are some things that that I think the president still has on his agenda that he that he should try to work with Republicans to try to get right. Some of those things are good for everybody, uh, and if you can pick off enough uh, Republicans, uh, you know, guys in the Senate, guys and gals in the center, and 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 make uh, make the case, uh, you can actually get some stuff done. I think two years yeah. of gridlock is 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 too much given all the problems that we have, and uh, and Biden would be right to try to keep pushing, keep going forward. Well, it's going to take some wheeling and dealing, and I don't know um, <laughs> how prepared he is for do, to do that. And I don't think Republicans are in the mood uh, to give this president any victories. I mean, that may be good or bad, but it's the reality. I think that's and bad. Yeah, <laughs> everybody's pointing to twenty twenty four. So yeah, they are. Well, All right. Well, be an we'll see how. Years. Yeah, three more weeks in the year. <laughs> there we go. The Illich family's Olympia Development of Michigan is holding formal presentations for Detroiters to learn about the revised plans for the District Detroit project. The proposal includes hotels, office buildings, restaurants, and housing. I sat down with Bridge Detroit reporter Malachi Barrett to get an update on how residents are feeling about the planned development and its impact on the community. Malachi, for those of us who may or may not be super familiar with the area, uh, what is the District of Detroit? Where exactly is this happening? Maybe give us some familiar landmarks so uh, people can orient themselves. Largely what people envision when they think of District Detroit is kind of this no man's land in between downtown Detroit and the area that folk kind of refer to as Midtown now. A lot of empty parking lots, a lot of kind of vacant land that's been um, you know, deciding there's been some decisions on what to do with it that have been kind of cooking for a while as we'll, we'll kind of get into. As we're talking about this, what is being developed? Who are the players in this? Uh, and, and what stage are we at? Are we planning? Are, has, has the ground been broken? Where are we at with that? Yeah, so in a lot of ways, we are kind of right 
back at the beginning of, of where we started with District Detroit. This is a new vision for the area that has long been kind of under the control of the Illich family. Uh, their development firm, Olympia Development, um, and Stephen Ross uh, of the University of Michigan fame and, you know, a, a pretty influential developer in, in New York City. His development firm uh, related companies are kind of teaming up uh, to release this new vision for the District Detroit area. Uh, as far as where we're at right now, I mean, things haven't really progressed very far. We have some renderings of what they would like to do in the area. You know, we have designs for uh, hotels and office buildings and some of the restaurants and things like that. Um, but no shovels are in the dirt yet. They haven't secured any of the public financing that they'll likely rely on to, to make this happen. As these developments are being proposed, as plans are being made, the companies who are doing this development have to interact with, you know, the local communities and the residents that they're building these things and doing all this construction around. Um, so where is the process at with that? Have have there been talks with uh, any community organizations and, and how is that panning out so far? Yeah, so Detroit, um, like some other large cities, but kind of unique uh, in Michigan, we have what's called the Community Benefits Ordinance, which kind of outlines a process where developers, if they're going to seek public money to finance their projects, if they're going to seek tax breaks, incentives, these kinds of things that we usually give large developers when they're working on, you know, big downtown projects like this, um, before they are approved for that financing, they have to go to the community and they have to meet with a council of community members uh, and talk with them about, you know, what is the impact of this development going to be on the area? How can they negotiate uh, some things that, that create some positive benefit? In thinking about that relationship that has to be developed, have you gotten a chance to speak with any of the residents, any of the people who are going to be in these impacted areas? And if so, what is the, the general sentiment? Because a lot of times, when developments are happening in Detroit, uh, a big concern is making sure that, A, yes, it does benefit the community, but that the community who is currently there has the ability to remain and, and have a voice in that. So what have you heard from the residents in the area? Well, first of all, I, I think it's important to note that this announcement kind of landed with a, a collective eye roll in Detroit. <laughs> um, you know, folks have as we've alluded to in this conversation, you know, heard this before from the Illich family, um, you know, these, these big aspirational projects for shiny buildings and, and, you know, new restaurants and new hotels. Sounds great on paper. People have kind of heard similar things before out of the Illich family when it comes to this part of the city and don't have much to show for it um, over the last decade. So I think there's a lot of skepticism just, you know, at a starting point, and, and that's going to be something developers will have to work through. What specifically are you going to be keeping your eye on as these developments develop? Well, we, we talked about the community benefits. So I think that's a big piece. What is the community going to ask for? And, and how is that going to be formalized in an agreement? And how is that agreement going to be enforced long term? Hmm. Um, if development plans change, Will the city hold developers to, uh, you know, their commitments there? In the larger context, too, of, of just Detroit talking about the merits of uh, of giving tax breaks to some of these more wealthy developers. Obviously, the Illich family um, <laughs> has quite a bit of uh, yeah. capital and resources to work with, right? So, so you know, do they? Can is it justified that they ask for uh, the taxpayer to uh, to provide some help? You know, the city right. had this huge conversation over the summer about uh, Dan Gilbert and the Hudson site. And I think we're going to go oh, through yeah. a similar kind of process, right? People are really kind of keyed in now about what do we get out of these uh, agreements? And, you know, particularly for the neighborhoods that are maybe touching this area, um, but certainly for neighborhoods further outside of the downtown, people are really wondering, like, what is the benefit for us? Um, this, this seems to be kind of concentrating the economic impact within the downtown area. There's not as much spillover, um, you know, to some of these commercial corridors or other areas where, you know, Detroiters, uh, longtime residents, locally owned businesses are, are really in play. Uh, people right. are going to look for that kind of access in, uh, in these new developments in the district of Detroit, you know, uh, okay, you say you're going to allow some retail space. Does that mean local retailers are going to be able to take advantage of that opportunity? Or does that mean, you know, businesses from the outside of the community are going to come set up shop here? So, you know, right. as always with these things in the public arena, it's, it's a, 
there are winners and losers and, and finding out who those winners are going to be and, and who maybe won't benefit as much from this is, is really kind of the meat of what we're going to be tuned into. And finally, the play Nora is showing at the Detroit Public Theater. It's written by internationally acclaimed Michigan-born playwright Heather Raffo, who also stars in the title role. The play tells the story of an Iraqi woman and her family who fled their country several years ago. As they celebrate Christmas in their adopted home of New York, a surprise visitor shows up and forces them to confront their past. I know you want to sponsor every Iraqi orphan. Once we open that door, you know it will not Not be every orphan, one from Musa, from my grandfather's church. She can bring Musa back. And she's lucky to be alive. The least we can do is help with school. Theater really is a tool to create empathy. We're telling stories, not to an audience, but with an audience. She's gonna stay a week. At most two, she's got school in California. You see these stories that maybe you don't know personally, but you can watch and say to yourself, oh, I know what that's like. I'm just saying, if you want to hold on to what Iraq was, maybe you need to remember who you were. Hey, who was I? Who? Nora is about um, an Iraqi family that has immigrated to the United States and are really examining kind of what it means to be Americans, what it means to be Iraqi Americans, and they're celebrating Christmas. And so uh, just like any family, as they come together to celebrate their Christmas, a lot of things start you know, feelings start coming out and um, a lot of things happen. Right, Alex? This is the language. This dinner in Arabic, how different would it be? Circling each other for hours, gossip underneath each word. Heather Raffo is an internationally acclaimed playwright and performer um, whose work we have loved and admired for a long time. And so uh, this is a play that we wanted to produce for a long time and the moment was finally right. What inspired me to write Nora was the convergence of many things. One being when ISIS overtook Mosul and just that sense of um, I had Iraqi family in Iraq through multiple wars. For thousands of years, my family had been rooted there, but that felt like the last straw in a way. So since that time and in the last 10 years, I've had family now scattered in diaspora across the world. And Nora is hugely about family. You know, it's a refugee family living in America, living an immigrant life, but very attached to back home and questioning if they're still Iraqi anymore that once you leave, and if you leave in a particularly harrowing way, do you still have the root system? I won't say anything. You're a doctor, why not just lecture me on smoking rather than my obsession with my dying identity? <sighs> and another inspiration was I had been working for four years with a um, Middle Eastern and Arab American community throughout New York City. The stories they told were ones of strength and resilience, but all of them felt torn between culture. And the real pull between what America offers, which is a focus on rugged individualism, and what Middle Eastern culture offered, which was a focus on community. And we all kept saying in this workshop, like, why isn't there something a little bit more in between? And that's a line that Nora says in the play is, I need a country in between. She wants something that can find the good of both and uplift that. Do we live for each other or for ourselves? I need a country in between. Heather Raffo is incredible. She is such an inspiration. What drew me to the play Nora was the fact that it was such a great representation of my culture. I read her words when I was in Michigan and she was all the way in New York and I couldn't believe how seen I felt by a person I had never met before. So I think she is just incredibly powerful and she has an amazing ability to draw people in with her empathy and creativity and warmth. And I think it does a great job bringing awareness to the refugee crisis, and it also does a wonderful job preserving our culture. Uh, please turn it off. I can't stand this propaganda. Not on Christmas. No, they're the only ones praying for the refugees right. today. That channel's not even Iraqi. It's evangelical out of Texas. What, you don't care? How many in Arbil, trapped in malls, freezing on Christmas? I don't care, but can't I have a day? 
My whole year is saving other people's lives. I would like a chance to live mine for once. Nora came here with her husband Tarek and their son Yazin. Eight years ago, they live in New York City and they've been sponsoring an Iraqi refugee named Mariam, who lives in California currently, and they're going to fly her out for Christmas dinner. And their friend Rafa also lives in New York. I believe it sparks a lot of conversations about what it's like to live here now and be an American and what they left behind from their past. No. You can live amongst Arabs or Christians or Iraqis anywhere in the world. It would never be the community it was. Not again. But don't so you feel a great loss? Yes. The play, Nora, honors that tremendous weight of leaving home in two ways. It, it allows some of the characters in the play to want to leave home to want a new life, to want to forget. And it allows other characters in the play to struggle with feeling like they have to forget and they have to move on. It allows for a feminist, female, central character to be the one who doesn't want to have to move on and yet realizes that she is being forced to in a way just for her own survival. And she gets to speak a monologue in the end that I would say the entire play was written in order to be able to speak this monologue in context. No wonder so many of us are drowning. The responsibility, it's just, it's impossible to bear. It's just the way to be erased. I think all audiences can relate to what it feels like to search for a place to call home. There are so many moments, and Heather writes this beautifully, where we are fighting for the love, and then we might have a moment where we lose the love, but then we recover, and we try and find love again. And I think everyone has experienced moments like that. Who do I love? Me. <laughs> Who else do I love? Dad, Nana, and all of our friends, all over the world. Who the most? Me. <laughs> I mean, I think what is most touching about this piece is the way this family navigates love. There is a really beautiful scene between Nora and her son that is just speaks volumes of, you know, how close this family is. There's an, also an incredible scene between Nora and her best friend from childhood. He is Muslim and she's Christian, and they are discussing both just what it was like growing up back home, how well they know each other but also the divisions that feel like it, they're, it's shaping their older lives that didn't used to be when they were young. And then there's, of course, this um, incredible relationship between this married couple that has weathered so many things and finally begins to talk about some of their history. And I think that in each of those respects, audiences will feel like they are both getting to eavesdrop on very intimate moments in people's lives, but also recognizing things very true to their own experiences. Of course she doesn't know who the father is. She should have saved everyone the trouble. Most of all, the tortured kids. Why can't she want a child? When you're a 20-year-old orphan running from medieval madmen with stuff to an American university, the last thing you want is a burden. You know, I've never heard you so spiteful. She has a hold on you. I hate to see you attached. To someone I don't trust, she could hurt you. How? It's a huge honor to be bringing, telling this story in the largest Arab American community in the country. It was also really important to us that this cast in this community be Arab American. There's a specificity to this cast in that we have two Chaldeans in the cast playing Chaldeans. We have an Assyrian playing Chaldeans. So those are three Iraqi Christians playing Iraqi Christians. We also have Kal Nega, who's an Egyptian movie star, a Muslim, playing the role of the Muslim best friend. It's just everybody is bringing their own cultural specificity and mixing that with how they see the characters. You know, we, we really got to experiment with this play in a really fresh and interesting way. And for that, I'm, I feel really fortunate. I hope that the Iraqi American community can come and see this show and see themselves in it. I want them to feel the way that I felt when I first read this play, that it felt like home, it felt like being seen. As playwrights, as I'll just speak for myself, I bear my soul, I bear my heart, I say the bravest things I can possibly say. When I'm performing, I try to do my bravest work 
by embodying that. And all of that means that I would never tell anyone what to think of it. But I think that in this piece, if I did have a wish, it's just that they go forth with their family, with a stranger, with their neighbor into a deeper conversation. I don't know how to let go and hold on at the same. You can see Nora at the Detroit Public Theater through December 18th. That will do it for this week's One Detroit. Thanks for watching. Make sure to come back for One Detroit Arts and Culture on Mondays at 7.30 p.m. Head to the One Detroit website for all the stories we're working on. Follow us on social media and sign up for our weekly newsletter. From Delta faucets to Bear Paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.